family is saying it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday now. Coming up this afternoon, generations of kids let down. A landmark review warns that children who want to change their gender are being failed by the NHS because of weak medical evidence. Meanwhile, has the UK turned on Israel? The Prime Minister says the situation in Gaza is increasingly intolerable as President Biden accuses Israel of making a mistake. And the £54 million pound fraudsters, a gang of Bulgarians, admit to masterminding the biggest benefit scam in British history. All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Divya Kohli. Good afternoon. A major review into gender services is calling for a more cautious approach to children who are confused about their sex. It found children have been let down by lack of evidence on medical interventions in gender care. The review, led by Dr Hilary Cass, is calling for a more holistic approach to the services, especially for children with mental health needs. Gay rights and feminist activist Linda Bellos told Talk TV she's relieved by the findings. I've been a lesbian feminist for, well, 40 years. I've seen this happen only in this way in the last five to seven years. It wasn't happening. Many of my trans friends didn't have the kind of pressures that are being made now. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has defended the decision not to stop arming Israel, saying none of our closest allies have done so. The Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron made the announcement on his US visit amid growing pressure over the government's weapons trade with Israel following an airstrike which killed aid workers and the ever-increasing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. To support Israel and its legitimate right of self-defence to deal with the Hamas threat and it's important we maintain of that support. We back the hostages and their families who are now in day 185 of their appalling captivity. We go hard on getting aid into Gaza. Lord James Arbuthnot is the latest to vent his frustration at the inquiry into the post office horizon scandal. The long-time advocate for sub-postmasters first wrote to the government in 2009 about the troubled IT system and asked for it to be investigated. He says he was left disappointed and worried by the decision of multiple governments to remain at arm's length from the post office, which he described as a dangerous dog. You cannot say that uh, the dangerous dog has an arm's length relationship with you. Uh, if you, uh, if the dangerous dog behaves badly, uh, so the whole process of arm's length control is a worrying one. A fresh crackdown has been launched on retail crime with violence against shop workers to be made a specific criminal offence. Persistent shoplifters could also be forced to wear tags. Victims and Safeguarding Minister Laura Farris has suggested shoplifting is by and large linked to organised crime rather than the cost of living. The U.S. state of Arizona has reinstated a near-total abortion ban. The laws, which were abolished 160 years ago, have been brought back, which could make abortion punishable by up to five years in prison unless a mother's life is at risk. And it could see clinics shut down across the state. It comes two years after the historic overturning of the Roe v. Wade legislation.
And three-time Olympic gold medalist Max Whitlock has announced his retirement. The 31-year-old uh, Britain's most successful gymnast has said he will be standing down after the Paris Olympics. He says his main motivation for the next Games is that he wants his daughter Willow, who's five, to watch him compete. That's the latest weather time now with Nazni and Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. For many areas, a sunny start out there this morning, but rain is already starting to spread its way eastwards. That started across parts of Ireland, Northern Ireland, western parts of Britain this morning. It's a warm front with it, some heavy downpours of rain, particularly around western parts of Scotland, where there is a rain warning in force from the Met Office, uh, valid until 10pm. There is a risk of flooding there. The rain's most persistent across parts of the north, more like patchy outbreaks of rain with brisk winds across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and that rain reaching eastern parts of England by the end of today. But it is mild despite this temperatures up to around 13 or 14 degrees celsius and into tonight it remains mild noticeably so compared to last night where it was chilly and clear we see a cold front though sweeping its way southeastwards with further rain for northern and western parts of england and wales later the midlands and some central and eastern areas scotland will continue to see rain spread eastwards northern ireland becoming drier by dawn look at those temperatures not really falling from the daytime highs down to around 12 degrees celsius tomorrow that cold front continues its way southwards and lingers for much of the day along the south coast therefore it's looking rather cloudy and cool there but everywhere else a fine looking day lots of sunshine mainly dry and feeling a little milder as well times radio sponsors talk tv weather Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next two hours, including tougher sentences for shoplifters who assault retail workers and why the new Amy Winehouse film is so divisive. I think uh, rubbish is the word you're looking for, uh, according to all the critics. But uh, <laughs> today we're joined in the studio by Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Great to have you along. Now, uh, we're not going to talk about uh, this guy later in the show because we've already consigned in our minds... Uh, William Ragg to the scrap heap of political <laughs> history because his career is shatteringly over. And, well, it should be because mm -hmm. he sold all of his friends and colleagues down the river. Uh, and uh, I think he should be punished, yeah, not just to, yeah. said, oh, poor William got blackmailed. Do you feel sorry for him? Let, let's tell the story. Not in the slightest. Mm -hmm. So this is a guy tell the story, who... Tell well. He's not a household name, although he may be he rather now. more of one now. Um, his not very... Um, kind nickname from his critics is Toe Rag, not William Rag, but Toe Rag. And he's one of these characters, Westminster characters, who's a bit of a, a shadowy figure behind the scenes and has had a little bit more influence behind the scenes than perhaps some of us have realised. Now, let's just pause for a minute to consider what he actually did. He literally, without going into too many lurid details, exposed himself to blackmail. So he sent pictures of he himself, just as we exposed understand. himself. Yeah, which is <laughs> how he did it. Um, so not only did he send inappropriate pictures of himself, as we understand it, to someone he met on a dating app called Grinder, a gay dating app, but then when he came under pressure from the recipient of those photos to provide contact details for a load of other MPs and other Westminster figures, instead of saying, yeah, on your bike, in slightly more colourful words than that, and blocking the guy from his phone, he duly complied and distributed a load of numbers. As a result, he compromised his colleagues. Now, this is extraordinarily serious. Yes, Not only it is it extremely Absolutely. rude, it's very serious. We don't know who the guy is from Grinder. Could they be an asset of a hostile exactly. state? Yeah. And so on. So when I first heard this story, as a Westminster veteran, I thought, that's a by-election. That guy's going to have to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But not only is it not a by-election, it's taken a very long time for him actually 
to voluntarily lose the whip. So he well, is still in the Houses of Parliament, yeah. still on the taxpayers' uh, well, dollar. Not only that, you have people like Jeremy Hunt saying, oh, this guy's been tremendously so courageous. <laughs> so brave. Uh, one thing that I think smells a bit funny is when you, I mean, Nadine Doris has sort of got her own take on this, as uh, she often does when it comes to who wanted Boris out and in a 1922 committee in her book, The Plot. Um, it does seem to me that William Wragg was never that far away from plotting and scheming and backstabbing. And if her accusations are truthful, then she has basically said that this guy, when Chris Pincher sort of you know, got himself into trouble and then that was the downfall of Boris Johnson, when people said about Boris, what did you know about this whole event? That this guy basically said to a friend of his, oh yeah, we've got him now in terms yeah. of, oh, we've caught Chris Pincher mm -hmm. in the, the act. He sounds to me like somebody who was always in the middle of trying to honey trap and do similar things to other Trouble people maker. Trouble maker. and then finds himself in the same position. I wonder what else there is that's going to come out and who's behind this. Well, what about... Uh, here's what I think about it. You, you know, as you said, Isabel, I mean, there are very serious implications about this. And I... You know, I'm not an expert on the law, but I think the police should be involved. And certainly the parliamentary system, rather than patting this guy on the back and saying, oh, you've been so brave, should be punishing him. Mm. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I'm afraid I have to ask whether this guy's had special treatment because he is gay. Right. Um, I, I'm just going to throw that out there. It may be a controversial thing to say, mm -hmm. but we have seen this time and again with people, there was somebody who did something completely inappropriate and then got away with it because he said he was transitioning or something. Right. Um, minorities, if that's how they are seen, should be treated exactly the same yeah, since they want equality. Yeah. So that that is my sneaking suspicion. I think that what he did was completely reprehensible and it would be the honourable thing to step down. And I also think As an MP. Uh, the backdrop to this is the Tories uh, treated him with uh, kid gloves because they are terrified of another humiliating by-election. Yep. Uh, so it looks like he will limp forward as an independent. He said he's standing... Mm. He had said he was standing yeah, down Yeah, at the next anyway. election anyway, but no. uh, it should have been a by-election, but it looks like yeah. he's going to get away with that. The other big story of the day, which we'll be talking about in just a little while, is this extraordinary cast report, uh, which basically lays to waste and uh, destroys the ludicrous work that the NHS has been doing with uh, gender-confused children now for a number of years. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that, into the details in just a little while. But uh, our basic question, uh, given that Dr Cass says that we have been prescribing children, uh, puberty blockers, with little understanding of what effect they will have in the long term. We've been basically medicating children without knowing what we're doing to them. It's absolutely extraordinary. So we are asking, has the NHS let down generations of gender-confused children. Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000 or you can text us, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222 or you can tweet us on x at talk TV. Now, as we were just saying, a damning new report has found that children seeking gender care on the NHS have been let down by a lack of research and evidence. The report, led by retired paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass, found no good evidence for puberty blockers to adolescents. It warned that the toxicity surrounding the trans debate had influenced doctors and their decisions. Uh, the report also claimed that mental health conditions could be confused for gender-related distress. And Dr Cass found that there is remarkably weak evidence for many of the gender treatments currently provided. Uh, well, NHS England has said it is reviewing the report's finding and has instructed clinics to pause first-time appointments for under-18s. We're still joined in the studio uh, by Isabel Oakshot. Uh, that's my question here. I mean, this is not the first time that uh, the truth about what we've been doing to, or what the NHS has been doing to children now for uh, a number of years has been revealed. As I always say, the Tavistock Clinic for uh, Gender-Confused Children was, uh, was and still is uh, Frankenstein's Castle, where children go uh, to get prescribed uh, life-changing drugs and go to get mutilated. It's unbelievable that this has uh, carried on. So uh, let's uh, get a doctor's perspective on this. Uh, do joining us now is uh, GP uh, Dr Dean Eggett. Uh, did I get that right, Dean? Is it Eggett? Yes? It is. 
Yes. You did, that's right, yes, thank uh, you. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, as I say, uh, those of us who are not medically qualified, uh, well, this is what I think. I reckon in 10 years' time, in a generation's time, we're going to look back on the, the dark years of the Tavistock Clinic and what the NHS was doing to children who turned up and say, I think I might be a boy or a girl, not in the right body. This dark period, we will look back on this agog with what we did to children. We mutilated them. We gave them life-changing drugs. And as Dr Cass said, we had remarkably weak evidence about what effect they might have in the long term. Dean, what the hell has been going on? Um, it's not unusual for the NHS to try to be proactive and bring medicines to patients as soon as possible. But I am inclined <laughs> to agree with you in thinking that we, we, we were far too soon, in this case, to bring medicines to children to help them with these conditions. Now, let, let's be fair and balanced here. Gender dysphoria is very real and occurs in children as in adults. So that's not to say that children who are uncertain of their gender are making this up or that they're mentally unwell and actually they don't have gender dysphoria. They do have gender dysphoria. The question is, how is it best to help them? And I think that that's what the CAS report actually outlines. Now, this is a remarkable piece of work, four years of work, 388 pages and 32 recommendations, which basically tells us, stop, slow down, go back to the drawing board and decide, is what you're doing right now the best treatment or should we reconsider a different approach? And quite frankly, I agree. I think we should reconsider a different approach and slow down. I mean, you say that these children do have gender dysphoria. An element of this report was suggesting that maybe it isn't genuine gender dysphoria. Maybe it's a, they're presenting with complex issues, autism, bullying, social pressure. You've seen a huge change as well in... Uh, uh, gender dysphoria largely primarily being a, a, a something, a condition, a, a mental health condition that happens within the male population historically, then all of a sudden 75% of those presenting to JIDS were females. And there needs to be questions asked about what has induced this. Many people, there's been a report in America saying many of these kids who think they're gender dysphoric, about 75%, a few years down the line, grow out of it and realise they're not. Do you think these kids are being pressurised by popular culture, by things they're reading online, and rather than being challenged, as you would do someone who was body dysmorphic or anorexic, they've been totally affirmed and sent on medical pathways for a mental condition? Yeah, I think there are a couple of questions there. So I'm going to try and break it down a little bit, if that's OK. So first of all, do we believe that gender dysphoria is a real thing? Yes, it is a real thing. And I don't think the CAS report says that gender dysphoria doesn't exist and actually it's some other form of mental illness or um, mental difference from the norm, such as um, neuro neurodiversity. I think what it's saying is that in some cases where possibly overdiagnosing gender dysphoria because we're failing to overlook other mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, family stresses or neurodiversity. But that's also not to say that gender dysphoria doesn't exist with these problems. I think what the CAS report is saying is that honestly we've been too fast to say it's gender dysphoria, let's start some medicines, rather than okay, let's look at the patient as a whole and understand their life, understand all of their problems, then make a slow, confirmed, rational decision. So does gender dysphoria exist? Yes. Do we need to slow down to make sure we get the diagnosis right? Absolutely. Should we be putting everybody on pills at the first stage? Absolutely not. I would say that gender dysphoria definitely exists and we should sympathise with all children who suffer from it. But I would say that the number of people who su genuinely suffer from uh, gender dysphoria is far less uh, than those who are being told that they do. And uh, to be fair to NHS England, they clearly uh, started to worry because uh, this is four years ago, they commissioned this report by Dr Cass. So they obviously said, look, look, we need to really, really look at this. But while these doubts were be beginning to blossom, if you like, they carried on doing it. And what I'd like to ask you, I know it's not your fault, Dean, but what were grown medically qualified adults doing at the Ta Tavistock Clinic when kids as young as eight, year old, eight years old turned up and said, I think I'm in the wrong body, and they go, oh, yeah, 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 you definitely are. What the hell were they doing? Why don't you just, why didn't they just say, look, go back to the playground and... Uh, uh, talk to your mum and dad. It was ridiculous. You've got some really valid questions. <laughs> I think we as a society need to sit down and ask some of those questions and say, were those at the Tavistock Clinic being overly helpful and trying to get patients onto treatment as soon as possible? Or were they being 
pushed by society in trying to recognize this as a condition? Or were they recognizing that actually other treatments weren't available, support wasn't available, and support for these other medical mental health problems is not really readily available. So what they were trying to do is reach out to help patients at the earlier stage. Now, personally, I'm going to admit, I think what they were doing in Tavistock was wrong with children. I think they were treating them too early. I think they were diagnosing them too early. And this was being pushed at far too fast a pace based upon partly a desire to help children, but also some institutionalization and being outside of the norm and no longer recognizing what society is thinking because i don't think society agrees what was happening with tavistock either on behalf of the general medical profession i as a gp was looking at them thinking this this isn't right this is not okay but i think most of us are probably too frightened to speak up or don't actually have the opportunity to speak up or when we do speak up our voice isn't listened to until such as time as now where we have better evidence from um, dr cass and her team but this really gets to the crux of what the perversion of this phenomena has been, which is that it's become not just sort of, you know, normalised that uh, a child uh, can think that they are in the wrong body, but almost promoted. It's not just been a tyranny of silence. There has been active propaganda. There has been a push. It's almost become a badge of honour to turn around and say, I'm bringing up my child uh, without having a gender. I'm not going to put my little boy in blue clothes or my little girl in, in pink clothes. I'm going to let them change their name. Celebrities all over the place seem to have non-binary kids. This has become some sort of fashion item. And the net result of this is, I think, and I want to know if you agree with this, there have been a great many children trapped up in adults trying to shower themselves in moral virtue and rectitude who down the line are going to want to sue their teachers and sue their doctors and possibly even sue their government because about six months ago before this report came out if you ask someone from either of the political parties if they think kids should be allowed to transition they probably would have said oh yes that's brilliant and that's wonderful and progressive they wouldn't have had the guts to turn around and say that's probably a bit dodgy certainly i think harm has probably been done now, we can all think of cases with you know, our own families or friends where your little boy is dressed up as a princess at a party or your little girl has dressed up as Bob the Builder. Now, that's different to gender dysphoria. That's people just experimenting and playing. But believing you're a different gender is a completely different thing. Now, what seems to have happened in society is that little boy who dressed up as a princess, we've now started to say, well, you know what, you probably are a princess. Maybe we should treat you as such. And that has been a societal shift, which has put pressure upon children and upon families to adopt that as the identity of the child. Again, we as a society need to discuss that and say, actually, is that the direction we want to go in? Because society does change over time. Or we say as a society, actually, that pressure is wrong and we shouldn't be doing that. And actually, I don't think that decision has been made yet. I think we're airing our views of it. But as a society, we haven't decided. The important point being, from a medical perspective, is those children who we've taken the time to understand and diagnosed as gender dysphoria get the holistic help that they need rather than popping them on pills straight away. And those children who aren't sure and experimenting and learning, again, we give them the holistic help and support and do not put pressure on them to decide at an early stage and allow them to get help for any other problems that they may have before making any decision. Decisions take time. Uh, they do. Uh, Dean, uh, I wish there were more doctors like you. You exude yeah. common sense. Therefore, you will never do well at the NHS. But uh, <laughs> very good to talk to you. Thank you very much, Dr Thank Dean Egan. Uh, talk, talk, talking a lot of sense Thank there, yeah. uh, Isabel. Isabel Oakshot's still with us. Uh, and uh, as I say, uh, the, the thing about the Tavistock Clinic and this entire syndrome is the doctors, the medical experts, alleged medical, who worked in it, of course they want it to proliferate. So they were very, very keen to diagnose kids as being uh, in, in the wrong bodies. They mm. over-prescribed, they over-diagnosed, I think, and therefore we ended up with the situation we're in now. Yeah, I mean, there have been a number of whistleblowers from the Tavistock mm. Clinic who have said very powerfully just that. And I was involved, must have been a couple of years ago now, in the production of a documentary uh, in which people were interviewed who regretted having gone down that path. You know, they'd gone from one gender to another and then they wanted to flip back again, but they were missing some of their bits, frankly, bluntly. And it had been an awful thing. Um, Dr. Dean strikes just the right tone. Absolutely. Something 
uh, you don't know about me and Dr. Dean, is that I spent a whole day up at his surgery. I um, wonder why he, you knew how to pronounce his yeah, name. Yeah, <laughs> so um, I shadowed him for uh, a day at his GP clinic, and he is just the, the doctor that everybody wishes yeah, they I had. Say, really, really professional, hardworking. You know, the one you all wish you could get an appointment with. Yeah. Um, so I think <laughs> That's he, another story. <laughs> yeah, he, he gives a very good perspective on this. Look, this is monstrous. It I is. think it's monstrous. Mm -mm. And frankly, I don't think that a hard pressed NHS, which has an awful lot of core business to do, you know, give people their hip operations, give them their knee replacements, give them the heart treatment they need, should not be messing around mm -mm. with stuff on the fringes like this, which is very poorly evidenced. I'd stop the lot of it on yeah. the NHS. The way I see this, and I think everyone's being quite measured here, monstrous is getting close to how That's I That's how I feel about this. it. Yeah, exactly. I think that children have been the unwitting pawn in stupid, left-wing, posh people, elitist dinner party games, where they want to turn around and say, aren't I a good person? My kid is trans. Aren't I a good person? Oh, you don't think that kids can transition? You're basically a fascist and a and Nazi. An old dinosaur and all of that. Yeah. And I Aren't think... you dis and so people quite just had a commonsensical point of view and said kids shouldn't be given puberty blockers, dear Lord, were, made, were vilified and made to seem fascistic. And these people, frankly, have blood on their hands. They have overseen sure and actively right. encouraged the mutilation of and children. Can, They're sickos. Can we just talk for a minute about the role of corporates here yes. as well? These huge brands like Nike and yeah. others. Good that point. are putting uh, strange models out there. I say strange because I don't they want to see not. women's sportswear modelled by men. Yeah. I don't want to see women who are wearing chest binders or have men, had their breasts cut off. Or, yeah. I don't want to see that yeah. because that is promoting a very warped set of values and ideals to a potentially very easily influenced totally. young audience. It's I can't making a mental health it. condition it is, fashionable. It, it is and grotesque. That's sick. It's grotesque. By the, by the way, uh, uh, one kind of parent that uh, uh, took uh, their kids to the Tavistock a lot were pa parents who, for example, had a gay boy, a boy who was clearly gay, mm. and they didn't fancy having a gay kid, so they would well, go in and say, any chance girl. you could turn this boy into a girl? Oh, wow. And it was happening. I mean, yeah. yeah, It was happening. I mean, look, I, I, I think that gender dysphoria is a very delicate situation, much like body dysphoria, much like other things that uh, it's afflict tiny. people. It's tiny. But it is tiny, and these tiny things aren't to be promoted. They're not Gucci handbags. Yeah. And what they have done to kids, I mean, a scourge on all their houses, and anyone from the Labour Party and the rest of them, when I say, we want to work with the NHS to make sure children get the services they need, oh, right, changed your tune, have you? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's just like revolts say, me. Like I say, in a generation's time, people will look back at the Tavistock Clinic and this entire syndrome, gender dysphoric kids, and they will go, we, we did what? We the doing? NHS yeah. did yeah. what? Yeah. It's just extraordinary. It's corporate it stupidity obscene. and wickedness, to be it honest with you. It is wickedness. Right, on that note, let's have a little break, <laughs> shall <more>. we? <laughs> Coming up after that, the Prime Minister says the situation in Gaza is increasingly intolerable as he backs calls for an immediate ceasefire in the region. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Rishi Sunak has joined his American counterparts, Joe Biden, in calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. The Prime Minister said this morning that the situation in the region is increasingly intolerable, and he said he is urging Israel to change its tack. Uh, these remarks follow President Biden's claims that Israel is making a mistake in how it is handling the war. Uh, we're still joined by, uh, appropriately, Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Uh, now, Jake Wallace-Simon, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, has got a really uh, disturbing piece in the new edition of The Spectator magazines in which he says he's obviously a big supporter of Israel, uh, as am I, as am uh, Alex, and I think you are too. We stand with Israel. We still remember remember what happened on October the 7th. But uh, Jake says that uh, ever since Biden and now Sunak and Cameron started pulling the rug from underneath Netanyahu's uh, feet, saying, you know, you've got to carry on like this, you've got to uh, look at the humanitarian crisis, all that. He said, basically, we've gone from winning the war. He said, now Hamas is winning the war. Israel has all but lost because international support has gone. At one point, about a month ago, apparently there were 100,000 IDF troops in Gaza. Guess how many are left? 1,000. Mm. Uh, Israel's losing. Wow. Um, look, I think that that uh, accidental hitting of the aid convoy, uh, whenever it was 10 days ago, yeah. was a real watershed yes, moment. It, mm. um, it is very hard if you are on our side of the argument, um, if you are wanting to stand with Israel for all the obvious reasons, you know, mm. let's remember who started this conflict. Yeah. But it has become increasingly difficult uh, to keep on voicing the defence for some of the dreadful scenes that we are seeing. And they're very real scenes. You know, you don't have to say that these are the product of a Hamas spin operation. I mean, there really are people suffering very, very yeah, grievously in Gaza. And I'm afraid that Israel has lost the room. Um, worse than that, they are now facing a, a diplomatic crisis because the unity that there was around the West uh, on the side of Israel ha is very rapidly disintegrating. And, you know, it seems to me that there's not a great deal left of Gaza anyway, um, but I don't know how Netanyahu gets his way out of this. You know, he has got a domestic audience to worry about. Uh, he has somehow managed to hold on to his position on the basis that he is doing what it takes to ensure this can never, ever happen again. Unfortunately, that objective is essentially unachievable mm. when you're trying to kill an idea. And there are always going to be Hamas sympathizing operatives somewhere.
Yeah, I mean, this is the difficulty. I mean, much like everything else in life, it's become massively siloed. And the media, again, has played a part, I think, in a lot of this. I was listening to the radio this morning and listening to a number of IDF soldiers being interviewed. And one guy was like, well, look, I'm a reservist. I'm just a student. They said I've got to call up and defend my country. Never thought this, I'd have to do this before October the 7th. Always believed in a two-state solution. And he said, I've been going around trying to defend citizens in Gaza. That's been my job with Hamas snipers everywhere. If I die, I'm going to be remembered as someone genocidal. Yeah. And I think this is the problem. I think no other war. We, we're not looking at ghoulish scenes happening in Ukraine all the time. Far from it. People have just said, oh, well, I've forgotten about this, but this has become the latest political football. But where do we go from here? Where do we as the West go from here? What are the next steps? Because as you said, you're not going to defeat the idea. If anything, there are going to be far more people in Gaza now who viscerally detest Israel because their houses have been raised to the ground and rubbleized. Their family members members have been killed. Um, and, and the idea of a two-state solution now is probably further away than it's ever been. Oh, I'm sure that's absolutely right. And I mean, you know, if I was sitting here and I had an answer to this horrendous long-term conundrum, I wouldn't be working as a commentator here. I'd be, you know, at the top table in these diplomatic negotiations if they ever indeed happen. Um, look, I, I don't know. I don't know where we go. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know. Uh, the, um, Do you? Uh, <laughs> Nobody does. Well, one one, one uh, Israeli politician said in terms of the mission to destroy Hamas and where they're at now, he said you can't put out a fire by putting out 80% of it. That, uh, and and that was always the case. Therein the lies start. the problem. Yeah. Uh, shall we have a little uh, listen and watch of uh, Joe Biden uh, talking about uh, Netanyahu making a mistake? Let's watch this. What I will tell you is I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. I think with this, I mean, let's remember, this did come down to, like you said, that inflection point was that aid convoy being targeted. Um, and it's sort of turning around saying, we found the people who did this. We think there was a, you know, misreporting in intelligence. They hadn't followed protocols. It was dreadful and, and this is being dealt with. But I think we, it, it does make us call into question the operation over time of supranational organisations like the UN who have allowed themselves to be infiltrated by Hamas. Yeah. Money that's been sent into that region, which has been misappropriated and used to build these yeah. tunnels, yeah. and constantly this sort of confusion with are they terrorists or are they freedom fighters. Yeah. In many respects, the supranational community has enabled us to get to a Couldn't situation where more. the truth is yeah. murky yeah. and it's created this so, situation where those those three vehicles I'm really were glad that you've brought up the role of the UN here and the UN so-called Works and Relief Agency, UNRWA. Um, Trump, when he was president, was very, very adamant that we should not, I would say we, that's the US, the UK, by the way, we send multi-millions to UNRWA as well. Um, they are effectively pr have provided the infrastructure uh, in Gaza for a very long time. You know, Hamas doesn't run a, a government. You know, it, it, it may provide leadership of some sort, but it is the UN, UN money, that has effectively provided the machinery of government that has enabled Hamas to keep being there, to keep being in power. They're like the civil service. Mm -hmm. And they are, I'm afraid, they have been demonstrated to be riddled with sympathizers mm -hmm. to terrorist organizations. And Trump was right on this. Mm. Trump took away the money. Uh, unfortunately, Biden gave it back again. Uh, and now everyone's surprised that we have an even bigger problem than we would have if people had stuck with the Trump policy. Yeah, well, Israel is in trouble now because uh, we let them down. We just stopped being their allies, uh, proper allies, and so did America. Because, of course, it's all the woke brigade on the back, on the shoulders of Biden, and uh, soon that will suffer the children. The, 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 the humanitarian crisis, the killing there, is awful. Uh, but Israel has got a mission, and I think it's a shame that the West has forgotten that. Uh, and uh, because of the West attitude, because of America and Britain's attitude, I'm I'm afraid uh, Israel is in trouble and may not yeah. succeed in uh, in any way destroying Hamas. So we're back to square one. They'll do an October the 7th again. Isn't that well. good?
well, great. of course they We'd were. better move on. Yeah, Let's talk I mean, about benefits fraud. This is this is this, hilarious. Yeah. Talking about basically a lack of scrutiny and lily-livered bleeding hearts in various organisations doling out money. How on earth did a Bulgarian organised crime gang make almost £54 million by creating false identities and claiming shed loads of benefits? In five years, they're making over £10 million That's quid madness. a year. That's madness. Do people not say, really, you need to prove that you exist and that you've applied for jobs and gone to the job centre and that your kids are going to a school and, you know, all of this stuff? Or do you just write blank cheques to people who, I think, with this story, didn't just stumble into the UK and, you know, happen upon the fact they could cheat the system? I think they probably came here knowing full well they could do it, and that is exactly why they came to this country. I mean, there is so much of this around, whether at the low level, where people are just on the take for a few thousands, or whether at the high level, where it is multi-million pound operation. And it says everything about why we, as a country, are in the position that we are, because the welfare state has become so hopelessly bloated yep. and asks so few questions right. of the most questionable characters and applicants that we get cases like this, where multi-million pound frauds are allowed to blossom and flourish. And I'm frankly only surprised that this has been stopped. Well, it's yeah. mean and discriminatory to ask someone from another country if they deserve to be taking benefits well, they, from this country. They were, they, they, that. they were very organised. They operated uh, one of the... the uh, they actually ran a completely legitimate grocery store in Wood Green in North London, yep. near Spurs. And that was like a cover for their operator. And behind that was this sort of office room where they were literally throwing 20 pound notes into the air with glee. And they had one hold all that the police found, uh, wrapped up notes, 750,000 pounds in one Gosh. hold all I mean, look, in look, this room. Nowhere near is done, enough is done to tackle things that are quite obviously fronts for money laundering or mm. scams of this kind. Right. I mean, I am endlessly bewildered why these candy stores all over yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah. Hand money laundering Sorry, and no. barber shops. Barber well, you know, shops. When, did, when did anyone last pay 18 to 20 pounds for a box of cereal? Because if you go in those shops and spend some time, every single item is grossly inflated mm. in price. No one mm. pays 20 quid for a box of cereal. Yeah, and it, no, it's a very There's funny. a village down your way, I read about it the other day, it's either Wilshire or Gloucestershire. And, so, and, and it was in the in papers the West it, it, yeah, in the West Country. Uh, and one of the residents said, uh, it's like literally about 20 houses in a pub. And uh, one of the residents says, Why have we got five barber Barbers, shops all right. of a sudden? Yeah, exactly. These are money yeah, laundering yeah, yeah, yeah. operations. Yeah, people were worried knows. about paying reparations for slavery 500 years ago. And like, look down your local high street if I were you. It's anyway, still going on. Anyway, now we know why it's called universal credit because it doesn't matter or, whether universal. or not you deserve it. It's for everyone, it's <laughs> universal. Uh, we all now, pay it with uh, our taxes. Now, and you can enjoy it from Bulgaria. You can take this one up because I know it's got uh, under your skin this oh, story. The European oh Court of Human Rights, our old Just, favourite. The, what have they done now? This is mad. I mean, that court just needs to be raised to the ground. Um, so what they've done, and it's been a case led by one of my favourite cases in the country, Jennifer Seymour, um, and she has enabled some Swiss ladies to go to the uh, ECHR and say Switzerland is not abiding by net zero targets, and as a result, women like us are more likely to die when it's a really hot summer. And the ECHR have gone, well, you're probably right about that. <laughs> but the problem is, this makes case precedent. This now goes into the canon, if you will, of the universal European law, that if Mrs Miggins wants to take the same case against the UK government for not sticking to net zero targets, some lefty lawyer somewhere sitting in Strasbourg drinking his port will probably take mm. on that case, earn a shed load of money paid for by the British taxpayer and then to tell the government to change their policy. Yeah, well, this is neo-religion taking over the legal system it, by the back door. It's, it's a, madness. But it's an unelected court telling a democracy like Britain exactly how the government has to treat its citizens. It is saying now that Britain and the uh, 36 other countries that uh, are beholden to the ECHR must now prioritise uh, the yeah. protect their citizens against climate change. Well, some of us don't necessarily want, even accept I there's a climate Brenda change. I want Brenda from Scunthorpe to point out that the fact that she was paying green subsidies on her energy bills all that year is the reason why she can't heat her home and is more likely to die in winter. Well, Britain I mean, should turn this... around the ECHR and just say no, no, no. Right? I, I mean, I'd be a lot ruder about that. <laughs> <if> I... <laughs> Second words off. I think right? we could say many other things yeah. to them. Look, how does this work in practice? If governments have a duty to protect their citizens from the effects 
effects of climate change. I mean, I do think we need to see the small print here. But th does that mean um, that if you're sunbathing on Brighton Beach uh, and you end up with nasty sunburn, which ends up in skin cancer, are you then going to sue the government because they've failed to maintain the ozone layer? Well, yes, you are, now. you are now. You are now. Well, look. The, this is what we're going to get towards and we're going to get class actions of people with skin cancers saying mm -hmm. that you know the government should have done more to stop the you know make sure there was more cloud cover or something i don't know uh, you're going to get people whose properties have been flooded um, saying that that's all the government's fault even more than they already do um, look the weather um, I don't know, are we going to get to the point where people are suing God? Well, this is the mad thing, isn't it? I was watching an American, a clip from an American TV series the other day, and, you know, when you want to contextualise quite how much climate change has become a sort of balmy religion, there were these women, they're going, well, we've seen the solar eclipse, we've seen that big earthquake lately, and nobody's talking about climate change. Well, and you think... What the hell well, is this? Is this Paul Wall or is this uh, Texas? I, I couldn't quite work. I've only got... we, we see this uh, it's a cut to the sun. <laughs> which, we don't know what to do about it. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll have but, more uh, of that. Yeah, so, two, so 2000, we're going to move on now, but uh, 2000 Swiss women uh, took uh, their country to court uh, because they said it got, you know, climate change, it gets very, very hot. Well, Why was just, it women? just climb a mountain. Oh, yeah, you know, you've got loads of Alps. That. In the world of woke Lake religion, Geneva, the yeah. women are the big exactly. people who suffer from climate change. Yeah. They're the only ones who get sunburned. Yeah, by the way, uh, there was a picture of these, uh, well, a selection of these 2,000 women, definitely a couple of hundred, and all of them were about 90. They were all really old. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, you know, uh, be very afraid of old... Swiss future generations, Yeah, be I'm very sure. afraid of old Swiss women. And on that bombshell. <laughs> anyway, coming up after I don't know what break, that means. <laughs> the Point Minister launches a fresh crackdown on retail crime with plans to toughen sentences for those who assault shop workers. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin... Oh, I'm not, I'll start that again. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> I can't even say my own name. <laughs> and I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, I do believe. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, uh, the Prime Minister has launched a fresh crackdown, yet another crackdown, on retail crime uh, with plans for six months in jail for anyone convicted of assaulting a shop worker. We're still joined, of course, by the glorious and wonderful Isabel Oakshot. Well, there you go. If you beat someone up, you might go to prison. Who would have thunk? I just, I'm just, i sorry, though. I just don't believe it. When I hear the words, the Prime Minister has launched a fresh <laughs> crackdown, <laughs> I'm gone, I'm out, that's what's, it. What's you know, this crackdown on, Rishi? <laughs> it, the, look, this isn't going to happen, is it? We know that the court system is in <coughs> a complete shambles. And it's just not going to go anywhere. Excuse me? Yeah, I mean, what's going on here is it takes... I mean, even if someone does beat up a shop worker, they're not going to have their day in court for about three <laughs> years. When they do, some sort of liberal judge will probably say, well, you know, you've only beaten up 25 people this year. Perhaps you just need to go and have some time out. You've probably got a mental health issue. And even if they did get <laughs> sentenced to some time in prison, there's no cell to put them in anyway. So, I mean, it is, like Isabel said, it is one of those situations where you think the Prime Minister announces something normally that you think should already exist exist uh, as I can and tell. Uh, you know the police have basically uh, given up on shoplifting uh, so it's down to the shops the shops sell the police don't do anything I'm afraid that certainly the biggest stores they've got they've got to start hiring more and more security guards but they can't do anything do either these supermarkets make massive yeah. profits yeah. Mm. and you know they park one bloke it almost always is a bloke who's just like flimsily standing at the door not looking at all intimidating um, and then people run out and back and forth and that bloke, I mean, what was he supposed to do, run out after them? Mm. I mean, you'd like to think that would be what would happen, but you need to bolster that quite considerably. Um, and as for the threshold of £200, I mean, I think people should be pursued for shoplifting for a fiver. I yeah, mean, yeah, I don't yeah. think it should be a quantum thing. Yeah. It is a principle thing. Well, yeah, it's basically saying if it's under 200 quid, it's not stealing help yourselves so if you don't So people go and they it's steal £195 yeah, worth of goods. it's ridiculous. Uh, by the way, I, I think that... I mean, I know this is a minor factor, but I'm sure it is a factor, that this surge in uh, shoplifting yeah. has coincided with all the shops' new habits of getting rid of all the cashiers. Oh, I agree so, with that. So, so there, that. there's it's nothing, there's no one or nothing yeah. to stop you walking yeah. straight out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm actually surprised that the scale of fraud linked to that isn't much greater, but frankly, I think that the supermarkets deserve it. I hate those self checker I hate the fact you don't have a choice, you know, that you are forced into these tilts. And the latest insult is that they actually put up barriers. So even after you've done everything yourself mm. and had multiple occasions of unexpected <laughs> items, yeah, yeah. and having to call someone who takes ages to come back and forth, by and forth you then try to get out with your hard-won purchase and there's a blinking barrier and yes. you've got to put your receipt in before yeah. it decides to let you go. It's ridiculous. Uh, let's talk about drugs. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we might need some. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I don't want this one. This is the flesh-eating zombie drug, no, which has uh, <laughs> now been linked to 11 deaths in the UK. Uh, it started off in Russia. Uh, I'll try and pronounce mm. it. It's called uh, xylazine. And uh, when you take it, you inject it, it causes uh, your body to rot. God. So, therefore, uh, it is a flesh-eating zombie drug. And by the way, the England fans who are off to Germany uh, for the Euro tournament in the summer uh, have all been advised to book into these hotels, which are down, down Berlin's biggest zombie drug addict oh. uh, <laughs> alley. So, uh, they're worried about that. But uh, this is quite worrying, isn't it, this drug? Well, look, folks, just don't take it. I mean, I don't think it is that worrying. You're not going to be at any risk unless you actually take it. I, I don't know why yeah. anyone would be having this stuff. 
I mean, apparently this is a drug strong enough to tranquilize an elephant, and now it's moving in the illicit drugs market. But when you look at some of the scenes, I mean, I think in a Russia it was called Crocodile or That's something. That's right. That, and it yeah. sort of burst onto the sort of uh, the darker sides of social media about 10 years ago. You had videos of people with exposed bones and bits of flesh oh. just actually Ooh. hanging off their Ooh. rotting skeletals. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but then you've got all of these pictures, don't you, in, in America of the fentanyl crisis. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and it's just just mad. Yeah, this is this is enormous. I mean, look, we, we already see bits of this on our own streets. I was outside Vauxhall Tube Station a few days ago mm. with my kids and was horrified at the number of spaced out, yeah. rotting flesh people that were sitting on the street. I mean, there was one guy, he literally looked like he couldn't see anything. And he had his leg in a bandage of some suppurating wound under it. I thought, where am I? What is this? Yeah. You know, the streets of Calcutta. Yeah, no, it has. I mean, certainly where I live, it's the same thing. There's a sort of a, a, a drugs treatment clinic halfway down the street. And so they're all there at a certain time where they walk in around like the living dead. Um, but there are, I mean, there's a darker side to this story, in fact, where certainly in America... <laughs> well, as well, opposed to the lighter side. <laughs> like the lighter side. The lighter side of flesh-eating oh, well, zombie yeah. drugs, yeah. Yeah, forget the necrosis part. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, actually, there's a, there, there, there are interesting connections with where some of these drugs are being manufactured and who's bringing them into countries and who's trying to proliferate mm. them within the illicit marketplaces and mm. certainly with strong connections to hostile states. I mean, traditionally, of course, things like heroin propped up the Taliban. I think some of these more sort of impressively horrible pharmaceutical products are coming from our friends in the Far East. And the problem with xylazine is this. It, no doubt, I'll guarantee, I don't know how much it costs on the street, but I'll guarantee you it's cheap. Yeah. Therefore, uh, it probably will become... When you become... say our friends in the Far East, do you mean uh, China? I do yeah. mean China. Okay, let's just uh, say it as it is, shall we? China. The next yeah. big drug, drug <laughs> crisis coming to this country, just as it is in America, is fentanyl, yeah. where mm. I think over the last year, 100,000 Americans died. The scale died. of this is yeah. it's extraordinary. extraordinary. But we've left the door open, actually, because we've stopped prosecuting or, or actually sort of having any sort of prohibition mm. against illegal drugs. You walk down the street in London and every Marijuana sort of fifth person is just smoking weed Thinks on the street. Yeah. By the way, it's not just us. I was in a ski resort not that long ago, and there was a guy at the top of the mountain just puffing away on a joint. <laughs> top and of the mountain. Down it. Yeah, don't fancy I mean, skiing down with what him. What could yeah. possibly go wrong? Uh, now, uh, let's move on. This is uh, this is for you. This is apparently for me. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, dealing with an irritating boss. My boss is not irritating, if you're watching, Denny. Uh, magnificent man. Magnificent man. <laughs> uh, anyway, if uh, you are dealing with an irritating boss by writing... Uh, uh, and you get furious and you want to go, yes, you know, but you could risk your job there. So you, you have to hold your temper. Apparently, uh, what you do is you write down exactly what you think about him. So here I'm doing it okay. now. <laughs> you write and then you so, don't leave it on the desk. Exactly. <laughs> and then, and then uh, what does it say? It says uh, that what you then do, you've got all your emotions yeah. written down. There. You go like this. Yeah. And pop it in the and bin. And then you throw them in the bin. Hey! And that, then that all way. your fury is gone. So it doesn't work. Isn't that like what they say about don't send angry emails? Like, draft it and yeah. then just don't press send. But mm. I never really thought that 100% worked. I always yeah. think what people write on their paper is quite interesting. When I do my notes, I just have, like, little notes to self and a few arrows. Kev's always got massive crosses <laughs> and angry squiggles and he goes yeah. like this to I, make his point. St I am still furious, so that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> Isabel, what a great hour. Thank oh, you very thanks, much. thanks, Is. Uh, Isabel Oakshot, the, the remarkable Isabel Oakshot there. Now, coming up after the break, the damning report into gender treatment for children on the NHS. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin. I'm the furious Kevin O'Sullivan. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't oh. going to abandon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna, 
And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday now coming up this hour. Generations of children let down. A landmark review warns that kids who want to change their gender are being failed by the NHS because of weak medical evidence. Meanwhile, the £54 million frauds. A gang of Bulgarians admit to masterminding the biggest benefit scam in British history. And... I want people to hear my voice. No, no, no. Well, is that a brilliant biopic or a film worth missing? The new Amy Winehouse film has tongues wagging with some very mixed reviews. More on that later. Well, all of that is coming up. But first, let's get to the news headlines with Divya Kohli. Good afternoon. A major review into gender services is calling for a more cautious approach to children who are confused about their sex. It found children have been let down by lack of evidence on medical interventions in gender care. The review, led by Dr Hilary Cass, is calling for a more holistic approach to the services, especially for children with mental health needs. PM Rishi Sunak says his government welcomes the findings. Of course we must treat children who are questioning their gender with compassion and sensitivity, but we have to recognise that we need to move with extreme caution in these areas uh, because we just simply don't know the long-term impacts of what this all means and children's wellbeing is uppermost in our mind and that's why we've acted on the interim findings previously. President Joe Biden has hardened his stance over Israel's military action in Gaza, saying they're making a mistake and should call for a ceasefire. It comes as the Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron announced the UK's decision not to stop arming Israel on his current US visit. But he did discuss Britain's grave concerns about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. To support Israel and its legitimate right of self-defense to deal with the Hamas threat, and it's important we maintain uh, that support. We back the hostages and their families who are now in day 185 of their appalling captivity. 
We go hard on getting aid into Gaza. Lord James Arbuthnot is the latest to vent his frustration at the inquiry into the post office horizon scandal. The longtime advocate for sub postmasters first wrote to the government in 2009 about the troubled IT system and asked for it to be investigated. He says he was left disappointed and worried by the decision of multiple governments to remain at arm's length from the post office, which he described as a dangerous dog. You cannot say that uh, the dangerous dog has an arm's length relationship with you. Uh, if you, uh, if the dangerous dog behaves badly, uh, so the whole process of arm's length control is a worrying one. A fresh crackdown has been launched on retail crime with violence against shop workers to be made a specific criminal offence. Persistent shoplifters could also be forced to wear tags. Victims and Safeguarding Minister Laura Farris has suggested shoplifting is by and large linked to organised crime rather than the cost of living. The U.S. state of Arizona has reinstated a near-total abortion ban. The laws, which were abolished 160 years ago, have been brought back, which could make abortion punishable by up to five years in prison unless a mother's life is at risk, and it could see clinics shut down across the state. It comes two years after the historic overturning of the Roe v. Wade legislation. And three-time Olympic gold medalist Max Whitlock has announced his retirement. The 31-year-old, Britain's most successful gymnast, has said he will be standing down after the Paris Olympics. He says his main motivation for the next Games is that he wants his daughter Willow, who's five, to watch him compete. That's the latest weather time now with Nazlin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. For many areas, a sunny start out there this morning, but rain is already starting to spread its way eastwards. That started across parts of Ireland, Northern Ireland, western parts of Britain this morning. It's a warm front with it, some heavy downpours of rain, particularly around western parts of Scotland, where there is a rain warning in force from the Met Office, uh, valid until 10pm. There is a risk of flooding there. The rain's most persistent across parts of the north, more like patchy outbreaks of rain with brisk winds across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and that rain reaching eastern parts of England by the end of today. But it is mild despite this temperatures up to around 13 or 14 degrees celsius and into tonight it remains mild noticeably so compared to last night where it was chilly and clear we see a cold front though sweeping its way southeastwards with further rain for northern and western parts of england and wales later the midlands and some central and eastern areas scotland will continue to see rain spread eastwards northern ireland becoming drier by dawn look at those temperatures not really falling from the daytime highs down to around 12 degrees celsius tomorrow that cold front continues its way southwards and lingers for much of the day along the south coast therefore it's looking rather cloudy and cool there but everywhere else a fine looking day lots of sunshine mainly dry and feeling a little milder as well times radio sponsors talk tv weather Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the Bulgarian gang who scammed 54 million quid out of the benefits system. Uh, nice work if you can get it. Um, well, it's not work, <laughs> is it? It's the opposite of work. It's anti-work. It's being, being paid to do absolutely nothing. Well, Ridiculous. How weak are we as a country that that can happen? It's just a, what a lousy benefits system uh, that uh, <laughs> they found it so easy to scam us. It's over five years, 54 million quid. Uh, as you say, uh, these people from other countries, they look at us and think uh, this place is Honestly, a soft touch. It makes me feel like a mug having a morning alarm, commuting during <laughs> rush hour, actually working and then paying half of my salary to, I don't know, the government to give to Bulgarians. Mm. Why am I doing it? I don't know. I won't be doing it for long. Right, anyway, our big topic today, though, is this groundbreaking report, uh, the CAS report commissioned by the NHS four years ago after the gender dysphoria clinic at Tavistock Hospital was called 
into question. Now, Dr. Hilary Cass, who is a, a, an acclaimed paediatrician, was commissioned with looking into how we are treating children with gender dysphoria. And well, frankly, uh, what she has come up with is not exactly particularly affirming for what the NHS has been up to, essentially saying that there's been a lack of evidence, kids have been medicalised way too soon, and there are serious questions that now need to be asked. So we've been asking you, has the NHS let down generations of gender confused children? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. We'd love it when you call in and chat to us live on it. Text us 87222, write the word talk before your message, or of course you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. So, as we were just saying, a damning new report has found that children seeking gender care on the NHS have been let down by a lack of research and evidence. The report, led by retired paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass, has found no good evidence for giving puberty blockers to adolescents, and it warned that toxicity surrounding the trans debate has influenced doctors and their decisions. The report also claimed that mental health conditions could be confused for gender-related distress, and Dr Cass found that there is remarkably weak evidence for many of the gender treatments currently provided. Uh, well, NHS England has said it is reviewing the report's findings and has instructed clinics to pause first-time appointments for under-18s. Well, joining us to discuss this is NHS GP Dr Louise Irvin and Kate Barker, who's the CEO of LGB Alliance. I'm going to start with you, Dr Irvin, considering this was a report commissioned by the NHS and the results of that report really has been saying that everything that's been going on thus far probably shouldn't have been happening. What's your response to all of that? Yeah, pretty much agree. I think the um, whistleblowers have been vindicated. There have been... Lots of uh, clinicians who have been raising concerns about the gender treatment of youth, uh, children and adolescents for, for many years. And it's um, sad, but satisfying, I suppose, that this has finally come out. And what we've been saying all along is that there's no good evidence for either puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, that's oestrogen and, and testosterone, in uh, children and young people, adolescents. Hilary Cass was uh, commissioned to review services up to 18 years old. I think her, her report is fantastic. I've, it's very long. It's very, very well researched. And everything she says, she, she's backing up very well. And we I think this is going to turn a, new, a, a whole new chapter, a, a complete change. What we want to see is that the care for gender distressed children and young people should not be exceptionalized and not be treated differently from other forms of distress. These uh, you know, pe people would normally expect holistic evidence-based care. For some reason, this group of children and young people were put on, I, I wouldn't even say experimental treatments because a proper experiment is conducted properly, you know, um, with control groups and under proper protocol. This was just sort of reckless, reckless treatments uh, with, with life-changing, irreversible Im impact uh, with no evidence base and ears closed to criticisms and concerns for a very long time. Absolutely. It makes you wonder why qualified medical professionals went along with this. It's extraordinary. Uh, let's go over to you now, Kate Barker. You're the CEO of the LGB Alliance. I notice there's no T there. Uh, but uh, what is your take on this? I mean, I think the first thing we have to say is, you know, gender dysphoria is a genuine condition. Some kids genuinely suffer from it and do need help. I would suggest, I don't know what you think, Kate, that uh, gender dysphoria has been woefully overdiagnosed over the past 50, 10 or 15 years and that the uh, Tavistock Clinic in particular, known to locals who live around that area, me being one of them as Frankenstein's castle, uh, went out of its way to find as many kids as it could uh, that it could diagnose as gender dysphoric and then frankly prescribe for them uh, uh, drugs and treatments that mutilated them. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I very much agree. I mean, I, I would start by agreeing that it's a really impressive piece of work. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, that Hillary Cass has looked, looked so hard for evidence really th throws into kind of a stark relief how chaotic and uh, muddled um, and ideologically driven the service was. 
I mean, you were saying a second ago that somehow we've ended up here. I don't think it's a somehow. I think it's it's been a deliberate, ideologically driven program. And one of the things that the report picked out that was particularly interesting to us, and it's something we've been saying for years, is that the vast majority of children who end up at JIDS are same-sex attracted. And not when I say majority, I don't mean by a small amount. 89% of the girls and 81% of the boys. Now, Kemi Badenoch recently used the phrase transing away the, the gay. Um, and staff at the Tavistock used to joke that, you know, there are going to be no more gay kids left anymore. Because what's happened is gender nonconformity has been turned into a condition to be medicated um, by people who don't have children's best interests at heart. And I was very shocked to read in the report that the adult gender services staff would not cooperate with Dr. Cass in forming an evidence base. And the, to my mind, the only people that don't want to see evidence are those who know that the evidence will show that they're ideologues and charlatans. So I don't think it's coincidental. I think there's more to it than they're a bit muddled and they, for, they didn't do the filing very well and they didn't keep records. I think it's much more about a lot of people who want to see um, gender ideology embedded in our society and, and the people that suffer are the children they're the victims and it, it's you know astonishing that so many of these kids are self-identifying as being same-sex attracted and we should be asking what is it that's making kids who used to be happy to be gay mm. think no there's fundamentally something wrong with me if i'm gender non-conforming if i'm a, a girl and i like football that's an indication therefore that i really should be a boy I think yeah. it's absolutely wicked. It's a wicked ideology that tells little children that their bodies are somehow fundamentally broken. When yeah. left alone, most of them would just grow up to be happily lesbian, gay or bisexual. It so I think there's a danger of um, not looking for responsibility here by saying, oh, this is awful that this has happened. and we, We're not sure how this has happened, but now we're going to fix it. I think there's a bit more to it. We really need to root out why this has happened, how this was allowed to happen for so long. I mean, we know, for example, that some LGBTQ plus lobby groups and very influential charities were able to have a direct line to the Tavistock. These were people that had no clinical training at all, were able to have a direct line to the Tavistock yeah. and ask that they, um, you know, treated treated children with so-called gender yeah, affirming care. There was some de deliberate The whole deliberate thing is a real, yeah. is, a, is yeah. a huge shock. It is. I, I believe. On, on this, on this, I want to bring Louise back in because something that really stuck out for me in talking about the phenomena and what the inception of this phenomena was, where all of a sudden changing your gender was not just something that could be normalised, it was actively promoted, frankly, whether it be by big business, whether it be by people online, the algorithms of Instagram and TikTok, whether it be by TV programmes sticking transgender kids in every single thing that's been broadcast, it's been actively promoted, I would say. And it seems to me something very interesting in all of this is once upon a time where gender dysphoria was largely a male-dominated condition throughout history, 75% of those presenting at such clinics as the Tavistock Clinic have been young girls. And there has been suggestions as well that this highly pornified society we live in, where little girls either got to be as perfect and uh, objectified as a Kardashian, or has that sort of uh, unwanted constant sexualization from a very young age that it's been preferable to them to want to hide behind changing their gender. I want to play a little bit of a clip on this particular topic from Dr. Cass first and then ask your opinion on it, Louise. The first thing to appreciate is this is a very different population of young people from the young people who were presenting to gender services um, some 10 years ago. So the original cohort of young people was really predominantly children and predominantly birth registered boys and now the predominant group is birth registered girls presenting in early teens. Now, Louise, I know, I, I think I understand that biologically women have a higher predisposition, a predisposition, say, to sort of more community hysteria and things like that. But what do you think is going on here? Why is it largely little girls who have been saying, I don't want to be a girl anymore? 
Well, I think this is a question that began to be asked five years ago, and there was supposed to be research into it. In 2019, the NHS England said it was going to be doing it, and they haven't done it. There's been an incredible lack of curiosity and concern about this 4,000% increase in referrals of teenage girls to gender clinics. At, that's 40 times the rate beforehand. It seemed to all suddenly accelerate in 2014, um, lots of theories about the reasons, um, very powerful ones, I think, uh, are those of social contagion. But also, um, we know there's also a rise in mental health problems in teenagers, especially teenage girls. Again, there's not enough knowledge about that. But we, we do know that teenage girls will, are more likely to um, sort of channel their, their distress or their anxiety or, or their issues into a, a, maybe a, a simple explanation. So it could be, um, and, and, and we see that people um, thinking it's it's to do with my body in some way. It's the body that's at fault. So that could manifest itself as anorexia. It could manifest itself as self-harming and cutting. And now it's manifesting itself. I must, there's something wrong with my body. And, and instead of just saying, to, and, and the research shows that many, the majority of these young girls have multiple issues. Many of them are neurodiverse. I think over a, th a third have autism. Great many have um, uh, other mental health issues like depression and anxiety. Many have had adverse childhood experiences and sometimes PTSD and sometimes have, have been um, sexually abused. And there's a very high percentage of uh, of the referrals have come from uh, children in care. So these are people with complex, young women with complex issues. And instead of services addressing these and helping them, they've been all too willing to say, all right, you think you might, there's something wrong with your body. We think there's something wrong with your body too. And we're going to put you into a, a pathway, which is going to create um, irreversible change, remove your fertility. <laughs> Uh, cause long term, we don't even know what the long term effects are, possibly affect cognitive function and brain development, certainly affect sexual function. And that is, to me, absolutely shocking and scandalous. As a GP, I do see a lot of young people and young women with mental health issues and children as well. And the problem is that our mental health services for children, young people, which is called CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, are really under under-resourced, understaffed, underfunded, and it's sometimes a one year or even a two year wait to be seen there. So I would say in a big sense, why don't we care enough about our young people and their mental health to pr provide decent services for them to help and support them holistically, which is what Hilary Cass has said. And secondly, why were some clinicians only too willing to collude with this idea that yes, there's something wrong with your body and we need to change it? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, can we bring uh, Kate back in? Uh, it is clearly wrong uh, to prescribe kids life-changing drugs uh, into which there's been very little research. Uh, Dr Cass talked about, you know, a, a, a distinct lack of evidence uh, about what effect these drugs will have in the long term. That's clearly wrong uh, and has to be stopped. Uh, but what I think uh, kids have to be told uh, is that there's nothing wrong with being gay. Uh, because that's what's been going on at the Tavistock. Uh, sometimes it was parents who were frankly homophobic who would rather have uh, a, a, a girl, a boy who was gay, uh, shall we say, turned into a girl. They'd rather have a girl uh, than a gay boy. So I would suggest, Kate, that what we need to do going forward is to educate kids to say there's nothing wrong with being gay, uh, but there is a lot wrong with being prescribed drugs that will change your life and probably ruin it. Absolutely, and, th and that's what we try to do, um, and we speak to lo lots of young people. Um, uh, and I do think on that point as well about drugs and it being wrong to prescribe drugs like hormone blockers and cross-sex hormones. Um, one of the things in the CAS review, which we've been campaigning on for a while, is to block private and online clinics Good from idea. selling these drugs. Because people talk about long waiting lists on the NHS, but actually, lots of people are bypassing that, hopping onto their computer, ordering something online, having it posted to them. I think if it's wrong to um, prescribe puberty blockers to young people through the NHS, we must be able to close the loophole so that it's not possible to do it from abroad as well. And it's very difficult because these organisations, effectively, they're monetizing the, the misery of these vulnerable children 
And they're just profiting from the desperation of the parents who, by the way, are told hugely irresponsibly by a lot of organisations that if you don't allow your child to have these drugs, they're liable to commit suicide. So That's a, just a terrible thing to say. Really? And that was debunked yeah. as well very thoroughly by Dr. Cass in the review. So, so I really hope organisations will stop using that that kind of manipulation in, our, in uh, and that's what we've seen too much of here, coercion, mm. manipulation of the truth. And this report goes a long way to peeling back all the layers it does and indeed. finding out what's true and what's not. Okay. Thank you so much to, uh, to Kate Barker to and Dr Louisa. Do you know what, Kev, it just popped into my head? Blink and you would have missed it. And our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has very quietly dropped that conversion therapy ban. Do you know why? Because it encompassed conversion therapy for trans people, which means that if you're a kid and you said, I think I'm trans, you wouldn't have had access necessarily to talking therapies, i.e. going to a counsellor and saying, do you really think that this is true? Perhaps you are just a boy not a boy who's a, a, a girl in the wrong body. It would have created a nightmare scenario for psychiatrists and psychologists and potentially criminalised them from doing that. So there you go. Piece of rubbish, frankly dangerous legislation brought in by this government that's had to be very quietly by the back door gotten rid of. Well, at least they got rid of it anyway. At least they did. Now, you've been getting in touch with your thoughts on this topic. We asked whether the NHS has let down a generation of gender-confused children. Amanda says the NHS should hang their heads in shame. They have participated in irreversible harm done to children. Anthony argues everybody has overlooked the involvement of these drug companies that are supplying these drugs and those who most probably are receiving monetary inducements. I think it's very important to follow the money, actually. Yeah, always, in always. all situations, follow the money. Mm. And Shirley says, the ministers in charge of the NHS at the time these treatments were approved should be held to account. I agree with that. Mm. Uh, while Jeff thinks the Tavistock Centre needs to be closed down, and the medical staff involved in gender alteration need to be prosecuted for malpractice and child abuse. I'm sure that not all of them do, but I do think there are uh, uh, yeah. medics who worked at the Tavistock qu uh, Clinic yeah. who've got some extremely... Uh, serious questions to answer. Yeah. And politicians as well who point the finger at those people like you and I mm -hmm. saying that this is very questionable practice and needs to be talking, talk, uh, spoken about, calling people like us fascists, right wing, transphobic. They need to take a long, hard look Hate in criminals, the mirror. They, they are part of this. They have been part of essentially condoning child abuse on an industrial scale. Well, coming up after the break, has the West turned on Israel? Sunak backs called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you about that. laughs> yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Radio. Radio. Uh, now, <laughs> Rishi Sunak has joined his American counterpart, Joe Biden, in calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, the Prime Minister said this morning that the situation in the region is increasingly intolerable and urged Israel to change its tack. Well, these remarks follow Biden's claims that Israel is making a mistake in how it's handling the war. What he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. Well, joining us now is Paul Harris, editor of the Jewish Telegraph. Great to have you back on the show, Paul. Well, there you go. Skeletor thinks that uh, Israel should down tools and uh, essentially let Hamas get away with it all. Uh, what do you think about what he said? That's exactly as I see it. It would be good to see an end to the conflict, um, but I don't see any offer from Hamas to release the hostages um, as you know as a, as a deal, part of a deal for Israel to have a ceasefire. Uh, interestingly, uh, Biden is not asking for hostilities to end altogether. Uh, he is suggesting a ceasefire, so he must feel that Israel is doing something right somewhere along the line. But, um, you know, why are the hostages not being mentioned in any of this? Why does, has Biden not raised the question of the hostages and, and blamed Hamas for holding on to these in the most inhumane way? Uh, well, Paul, uh, Alex and I uh, still remember what happened on October the 7th. I'm sure you do too. Uh, that number of people who do remember, that seems to be getting smaller and smaller. Uh, we still stand with Israel. However, uh, the leaders of the big Western nations, certainly Britain and America, seem to be pulling the rug from under Netanyahu's feet. Uh, your oppo, your uh, great rival, I'm sure, Jake Wallace-Simon, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, he's got a piece, an article in the new edition of the Spectator magazine in which he says that due to uh, the attitude of America and uh, Britain now, as I say, basically speaking out against a country that's supposed to be our ally, Israel, uh, Jake says uh, Hamas is now winning the war. Uh, and uh, Israel cannot succeed without the support of America and Britain. Uh, why are these leaders of both America and Britain uh, deserting Netanyahu in his hour of need? Uh, I would say Hamas are winning the PR war, definitely. Um, whether they're winning the war is, a, is, a, is another matter. I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, it's very easy for Western powers to interfere at a distance and tell Israel what to do. But ultimately, only the Israeli government can look after its own people and knows the true state of what is happening. Um, Hamas are still a terror organization. Uh, Hamas still have um, terrorists operating within Gaza. Uh, Israel is still not safe. Uh, the south of Israel is still not safe. I, 
I really can't see what more Israel can do other than to take more care over to, to avoid civilian casualties. And it's very, very easy for Joe Biden to say that Israel shouldn't have hit the convoy. Of course, it shouldn't have hit the convoy. Israel has apologized. It's fired two senior officers and suspended three others. But, you know, Biden and seems to forget the number of um, American troops uh, and others killed in friendly fire in conflict in various parts of the world um, in which uh, America has been involved. It does sadly happen. Israel made a huge mistake. It's a huge blunder. It's more than a blunder. It's a tragic blunder. But, you know, I, I, I think nothing is served now by harping on about this. It's happened. Israel's apologized. It's not finished for the families involved or the friends. They're still feeling it. But I don't really see what more Israel can do other than to apologise what was a, for what was a huge blunder. I mean, when you look at uh, things going on in the Middle East at a larger, uh, it, you know, through a larger framework, you've now got uh, Iranian-backed Hezbollah basically have taken over Lebanon. Once upon a time, that would have been a lovely place to go on holiday, probably less so now. You've got ISK, this uh, new emerging block of ISIS, who are threatening football matches in Europe and bombed that Crocus arena in Russia. You've got the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels having a fun old time in the Red Sea, attacking cargo ships that is going to put a, you know, huge risk of inflation going through the reef once again in the West. And yet, at the same time, Western powers suddenly seem to be very squeamish about backing Israel, when it's often said that Israel is on the front line when it comes to the battle against terrorism. How much is this sort of potential disintegration of this relationship, this sort of falling apart of support from the West of Netanyahu, going to put the wider world at risk? I think um, Israel's cooperation with Western powers, particularly with America and Britain, when it comes to intelligence and fighting terror uh, in that part of the world. I think this is vital. And I really don't see this coming to an end anytime soon. I, I, I really don't. And I still think the major powers will be, still be cooperating with Israel. It has been said, and I think there's more than little evidence to prove this, that Israel has often done the dirty work for some of the major Western powers. You know, when it's come to targeted assassinations or um, taking action where the others didn't really want to be seen to be involved. So Israel, yes, Israel has been doing the dirty work for these superpowers, uh, Western powers. And I really think that will probably continue because I don't think they can actually manage without Israel. The thing is, Paul, while I think about uh, Sunak and Biden and other Western leaders, is they're straws in the wind and they blow with publicity. They're, they're affected by headlines. So, of course, you know, millions of people all over the world are going, oh, it's terrible, all those Palestinians uh, who are dying in that conflict. And it is terrible. However, there's a mission here. Uh, and uh, Netanyahu said he wanted to destroy Hamas. Uh, one leading Israeli politician whose name escapes me said, well, look, uh, if we have to stop now, uh, you can't put out a fire by putting out 80% of it, which is what would be the situation. If you leave 20% of it, it will erupt again into fire. Now, uh, so you're right. Hamas is winning the PR war. But because it's winning the PR war, Netanyahu is getting backed into a corner. And uh, not so long ago, there were hundreds of thousands of IDF troops in Gaza. It's now down to a 1,000. Uh, this lack of support from the West is very much affecting what Netanyahu said he was going to do, destroy Hamas. Uh, at this rate, he's just not going to be able to do this. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Israel has said that it was withdrawing troops before this latest round of criticism. And I think the operation has been scaled down. And as far as I see it, this operation will continue um, and there will be targeted attacks on those cells where they believe that uh, Hamas is still operating. But I think possibly the because the strength of Hamas has been depleted to such an extent, I would think that they, Israel probably doesn't need quite the number of troops that were there previously. What I th think is quite interesting, when you look at the coverage of this war, it seems to me have been 
well, <laughs> largely one-sided, I would say. Obviously, it's very easy for broadcast purposes to get those sort of, you know, drastic, dramatic television depictions of rubbleized places in Gaza. But I was listening earlier on to an interview with uh, IDF uh, reservists and one guy basically saying, well, look, you know, I'm normally a student. I was called up to come and protect my country. And my job has actually been making sure that the citizens of Gaza have been kept safe uh, and not caught in the crossfire with Hamas snipers. And he said, you know, what will happen to me if I lose my life? No one's going to remember me. And if they do, they'll probably think that I was part of some sort of genocide. Do you think that there's been, a, you know, that the, the, the way that mainstream media has reported this war has impacted some of the geopolitical decisions being made by Western leaders today? I don't think there's any doubt at all that the IDF is a very um, humane, humanitarian outfit. And I, despite what it might appear on screen, on our newspapers, Israel does not deliberately target civilians. This is a war, and sadly, civilians are dying. And this is, as, this is Hamas's fault. Hamas, as we know, deliberately embeds itself in major population areas, in hospitals, in schools, anywhere where it is aware that if it gets hit, uh, there are going to be civilian casualties. And, you know, what this young IDF man said is, is, actually, is, is perfectly true. I mean, these are kids straight out of university, some of them. Some of them haven't even been to university. They're called up for their um, national service, and they are told exactly how to behave. And the IDF does behave in a very responsible way. It may not look like that when we see these images of the dead, the dying and the injured and the rubble all over the place. But unfortunately, this is a war and this is what happens. Uh, Paul, indeed. Paul, great to so talk much. to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul Harris there, editor of the Jewish Chronicle. No, the Jewish, yeah, which one is it? Telegraph. Jewish Telegraph. Get it right, Kevin. Uh, good to talk to him as always. Uh, but next, a gang of Bulgarian crooks have been jailed for fleecing the taxpayer out of almost 54 million quid in benefits. Uh, the five fraudsters filed an estimated 6,000 bogus <laughs> universal credit claims between 2016 and 2021. Well, this is believed to be Britain's biggest ever benefit scam. Let's hope it is. I hope there's nothing bigger <laughs> than that out there. My word. <laughs> With the gang laundering the cash to buy expensive cars, clothing and jewellery. Well, joining us live is former police officer Mike Neville. Mike, you know, when I saw this story, it was breathtaking. But on some level, I didn't find myself particularly surprised by it. I mean, one can point to all of the lazy working from home civil servants who probably just ticked a box going, yeah, fine, you know, this latest... Uh, the avatar has been invented who wants to claim benefits and they're from Bulgaria and yeah that's fine just process it input the data off you go but do you think that there are gangs in places like Bulgaria who are looking at the UK and coming here deliberately to commit these crimes who back home have figured out how they're going to dupe the system and have come in order to do that rather than just sort of stumbled across it fortuitously when they got here well, what they see is, of course, we're utter fools, aren't we? We're utter mugs. Uh, they, they know that they, uh, one, the benefit system is very easy to swindle. And if you, even if you get caught, what are they going to get? Three, four years? What will be in that? Two or, two, two or three years in prison? And when you see the photographs of these characters with 20-pound notes thrown all over the bedroom, that's my 20-pound um, note, yours, Alex, yours, Kevin, your uh, viewers and listeners. That's all their 20-pound notes. And it shows the ridiculousness of uh, paying benefits in cash, because if you pay benefits in cash rather than here's a voucher that you can get some bread and cheese with that people really wouldn't want unless we're desperate. It, it, is, it is so bad, and it just sums up uh, broken Britain, doesn't it, that uh, it's too easy just to swindle. If you're hardworking, you're decent, you do the right thing, you've got people like this who are ripping us off. We've got enough villains and criminals of our own in this country without importing them from the rest of the world. There they are uh, in that film, all enjoying themselves, hurling £20 notes into the air. Uh, they were operating out of a number of establishments, but one was a grocery store, a legitimate grocery store in, in the Wood Green area of North London. And behind that store were holdalls full of literally millions of pounds. 
so uh, they found it very, very easy to rip off our benefits system. Uh, how do we stop that? What, what, what are the cops doing about this? Uh, I mean, are they vigilant on this kind of thing? Because it doesn't look like it. Not at all, Kevin. So if you're if you're going to commit crime, my advice is to, to them, to criminals, is to commit fraud. If you look at it, there's a thing called action fraud where things are reported. It's really inaction fraud. Uh, so the police are not really catching many uh, burglars and robbers and rapists, those people who physically hurt people. Uh, but one of the things that's just ignored is is fraud. So if you look at crime figures, you'll get the police publishing data where they'll say, oh, crime is going down, and then there'll be an asterisk. And when you look right at the bottom of the page, there'll be a little, a little comment saying, not including fraud. And the idea that this is like a unique circumstances, this is going to be happening everywhere. If you look at the, um, the bonuses that were paid during COVID, uh, how many billions of pounds were, were ripped off there? It's just too easy to come to this country and steal hard-working people's money. It's just with we, a soft touch. And the way to stop it, I, I suggest this. In fact, I could employ me in the government. I'll stop it tomorrow. If people are that desperate and hungry, they need benefits, then we'll give them a voucher where they can have uh, so much bread, so much cheese, so much ham and so much vegetables. That would be very easy to sell, uh, very, uh, very hard to sell. Whereas when you start giving people cash, it's very easy just to rip off the state. And we've seen this and there'll be hundreds of cases like this that haven't been uncovered. Yeah, Mike, I think you make a very good point there. But, you know, no one can propose that in politics, can they? Lest be called some sort of fascist. But on a sort of slight uh, segue, talking about fraud and talking about sort of visible fraud, if you will, we were speaking to Isabel Oakshaw earlier on in the programme and she brought up something that I think is really quite important. When you go to any sort of main town or, or city in the UK now, you've got a proliferation of hand car washes, funny looking nail bars. You've got these candy shops all over the main thoroughfare of the capital city, Oxford Street. And all of those, to anyone, even someone who doesn't seem to have, you know, like me, doesn't have much of an understanding of how you know, money laundering and fraud actually operates, look a bit funny and probably should be investigated. You're absolutely right. And I've walked down Oxford Street myself. How, how many American candy stores can you have? <laughs> and how many people are actually in there? What is the purpose of these places? It's obviously not to sell American candy. But everywhere you can see all this. And as I say, that the, uh, the police will focus on crimes where, if they do focus at all, they'll focus on things where people get hurt and injured. And so fraud is the ultimate one. And the, the modern police, uh, well, policing was never designed to deal with fraud because, of course, now I can sit on this computer, I'm talking to you, but I could be ripping off somebody in Sydney, Australia, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Tokyo, Japan, and, and no one's going to be able to do that. So these gangs, these Bulgarians or wherever they're from, will look at the UK why not target? You wouldn't target Saudi Arabia to do fraud because, of course, if they caught you, they cut your hands off and you'd probably be killed. But in the UK, you can rip off millions, tens of millions of pounds, and then maybe get a, a maybe a two-year sentence, which is to be reduced because the government doesn't provide enough prison, uh, prison places. So it's a very easy thing to do. And we're just going to attract more and more of this until we get a grip. And if people call me fascist or anybody <coughs> else who believes in it fascist, then let them do so. I don't mind being called names but we need to get a grip. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, it seems to me that this is all out of control. Benefit fraud, uh, identity theft, online fraud. Uh, the police need to raise their game, don't they, and uh, really get to grips with this uh, fast-escalating scourge. Well, the police don't keep up with things. So villains will always look at, so what's the next, but, you know, you've got AI, you've got computers, you've got the internet, you can do things internationally. And the police, of course, are focusing on the local burglar, maybe, or the local thief and whatever else. And so the world has become an absolutely enormous place where you can just, you can sit in a room in one country and rip people off in, in a million other countries. And so that needs to be sorted out. But at the moment, I think about 1% of frauds are prosecuted. So if you're a criminal and you think, well, I've got 99% uh, chance of getting away with this, 
he will. And if you know you're going to get a light prison sentence, you'll target the countries where that happens. Exactly. Mike, thank you. Ever well so done, Mike. Much. Thank you. I'm thinking about a career change. What about you, you Kev? Uh, what, benefit fraud? No, just fraud <laughs> in general. Let's, we can make after the show. Let's go to the pub and make a list of countries that we can target. Yes, indeed. Now, coming up after the break, a brilliant biopic or one worth missing. Critics are divided on the new Amy Winehouse biopic, Back to Black. We'll speak to someone who's seen it. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the highly anticipated Amy Winehouse biopic, Back to Black, premiered on Monday and has been met with some very mixed reviews. Directed by Sam Taylor-Johnson and starring Marissa Abela, uh, one reviewer said the film was so bad he gasped in horror, while another said it was cringeworthy and melodramatic. But before we get into the reviews, let's take a look at the trailer. I want people to hear my voice. and just forget their troubles for five minutes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you know what girl power means to me? Sarah Vaughan, Lauren Hill. You need to know this. I ain't no Spice Girl. Well, joining us now is showbiz reporter Caroline Foss, who enjoyed the film. Caroline, you've seen it. Uh, why'd you like it? 
Well, if we accept that there are a couple of limitations, stroke flaws, which I'm sure we'll get to, I think what this film does is two main things for me. It reminded me why Amy Winehouse was so special, why people continue to listen to her music to this day. And it also gave a little bit of insight into, we know that this incredibly destructive kind of Sid and Nancy-esque relationship she had with her, her husband, Blake Fielder Civil. But what it does is shed a light on the passion that really, we have to remind ourselves, fueled that amazing album, Back to Black, and did inspire this music that we still listen to today. So it was it was romantic, which I think we'll probably discuss because it's one of the problems so many people have with it. But it did for me, it kind of took us into a place that we've not really talked about with Amy Winehouse for many years because we've been so sadly distracted with her destruction and her decline and this was as well unbelievably creatively passionate and romantic and it, and it does I think it slightly redresses the balance of everything else we've heard. Uh, hi Caroline yeah I mean to be fair there have been a couple of fairly uh, positive reviews the Times was quite positive about it uh, but uh, Hamish McBain in in the Evening Standard the London uh, newspaper yesterday uh, called it a poor poor piece of filmmaking and said uh, this is a film that does not paint a nice or a fair picture of Amy as a human being nor does it get across how special an artist she was and uh, such so horrified was the Evening Standard by this movie, it devoted its entire edition to this film uh, that insults the memory of one of our greatest ever sinners. That was all over the front page. Uh, <laughs> but one of the aspects I wanted to ask you about was mm. that uh, her husband, uh, Blake Fielder Civil, Blake Civil, what was it? Blake uh, Fielder Civil. Blake Blake Fielder Civil. Civil. Is it yeah. Civil or Civil? Anyway, the, he was a junkie and he got her into heroin. Uh, and uh, many people close to Amy uh, hold him responsible for her decline and her death. Uh, he, apparently, in this film, is depicted as some kind of a saint, you know, who was looking after her, her interests, was worried about her and so on and so forth. And a lot of people are saying that just is not accurate. Yeah. I know that is one of the biggest gripes um, and it's it's the bigger of the two gripes that I'd like to mention. But this is the great peril. If you cast somebody like Jack O'Connell in a role, which you'll do, you know, he's a great actor. He's been in SAS Rogue Heroes. He was in Unbroken. He steals films that he appears in. He is essentially a likeable actor. So you cast somebody like that and you definitely you move the needle in a more favourable direction towards him I mean yes he's all a bit cockney geezer they meet in a pub in Camden he's playing pool he professes not to know who Amy is it's a you know it's your classic rom-com meet cute and then they kind of fall into this great this destructive love affair and it's quite clear that this lovely scene when they are playing pool together like very very normal boy meets girl is about the peak the happiest, smallest window of their entire relationship. And of course, we saw those pictures that told the truth of their story, of their destructive alliance in the years that followed. So I think that that is fair. However, I guess what we haven't had, I mean, he he always said that he tried, he was clean by the time she died. People who say he was the man who killed her, I think that that's painting slightly too simplistic a version equally in the other direction. Obviously, the truth is behind closed doors and it is somewhere in between all of these very different and very protective accounts of Amy's life that we've heard so many of. What has the family made of this? Has her dad made any sort of comment? Is he supportive of it? Well, yeah, I mean, so the family were all involved in the making of this film. I think for them, if, as I say, that needle's flipped back into much the other direction, this is as a, a reaction to the Asif Kapadia documentary, the Oscar-winning documentary of 2015, which very much laid the blame for Amy's tragic decline at her father Mitch's door. He said that he didn't let her go to rehab because she was performing too lucratively, almost like, you know, a sort of performing show horse. And, and what the thing that they do leave out of this film, which is quite interesting, is that famously she was in the Caribbean, she could have recovered, we'll never know. But he did actually take a camera crew out there with him to make a documentary. So, you know, all of these people... Handy. 
that was it handy. was yeah somewhat somewhat fortunate but Car none of these people were born you know knowing how to handle that amazing level of fame absolutely That's caroline we've got to go my favorite review said uh, if they try to get you to go and see this film say no 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 <laughs> uh, great to talk well to you caroline sadly though uh, alex we have come to the end of this show thank you for tuning in please do join us same time tomorrow 9 30 a.m up next show is jj anasiobi he's sitting in for ian collins bye bye from us Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky?